please rise? Commission on Judicial Appointments is now in session. Chief Justice Tony Cantillo Saka Uwe presiding. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome. This is the public meeting of the Commission on Judicial Appointments. It's noticed for this time and place. It's for the purpose of considering the appointment by Governor Edmund G. Brown, Jr. of Ms. Leandra R. Kruger to the Office of Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of California. As Chief Justice of California, I serve as Chair of the Commission on Judicial Appointments. Since 2011, that is four years in California, this commission for the Supreme Court appointees and nominees has been all female. The other members of the commission are Attorney General Kamala D. Harris and Presiding Justice Joan Dempsey Klein. Amoy Kim is serving as secretary to the commission. And I take a point of personal privilege to point out that Justice Klein, who will be retiring on December 30th, has served over 50 years in the courts, from municipal court to the Court of Appeal, being the presiding justice of her division of the Second District Court of Appeal. And so in many ways, this is her last legal act as a justice of the California Court of Appeal. We're privileged, Justice Clark. Thank you. The letters received by the commission were made available to the press and the public several days ago. The commission is in receipt of an official letter from Governor Brown appointing Ms. Kruger to fill a vacancy created by the retirement of Associate Justice Joyce Kennard. The state constitution specifies that an appointment by the governor to the Supreme Court of California is effective when confirmed by the Commission on Judicial Appointments. Pursuant to a request by Governor Brown, the Commission on Judicial Nominees Evaluation of the State Bar has undertaken an evaluation of the qualifications of Ms. Kruger. Mr. Jason Lee, chair of the commission, is present today to publicly share the results of that evaluation with us, and he'll do so later in these proceedings. Also with Mr. Lee is Eugene Ilomsky, the lead commissioner on the evaluation of Ms. Kruger. Welcome. Ms. Kruger has asked that the following persons be called to testify on her behalf. I'll first call your name as part of the list and then invite you to the podium. Originally, there were three folks, but one, that is uh, Ms. Blatt, Chair of the Appellate and Supreme Court Practice and former Assistant to the Solicitor General could not join us today because of weather in Colorado. So we will be hearing today from Mr. Benjamin J. Uh, Horwich from Munger, Tolles and Olson and a former Assistant to the Solicitor General and Mr. Thomas Liu, Legal Counsel at Google's Advanced Technology and Projects Group and former Acting General Counsel, White House Office of Management and Budget. I invite now Mr. Horwich to the podium. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the Commission. When I joined the Office of the Solicitor General some years ago, uh, where I first got to know Leandra well, she was already a legend there. She had seemingly worked on matters from every subject area in the office. She always had something insightful to offer when I was stuck. She was the resident encyclopedia on the substantive criminal law of every state. And she was amazingly able to communicate to new arrivals the endless and subtle considerations we should have in mind when advising on the tricky and consequential decisions that transcended a single piece of litigation. And of particular personal importance to me, who had just then arrived in DC from San Francisco uh, with my wife, Amy Tovar, and our six-week-old son, Leandra was from our state. And she welcomed me into our small band of expatriate Californians in the Solicitor General's office who are always thinking and talking very fondly about home. Because uh, Leandra, of course, has always belonged to California. She grew up in South Pasadena, just a little way around Orange Grove from where my aunt and uncle live. And so I have a little sense of her childhood, at least around this time of the year, with the Rose Bowl Parade, the Rose Parade preparations uh, in full swing. She studied at uh, Polytechnic High School. And after college at Harvard, she came back that time to San Francisco. And then Yale uh, took her east for law school, but she was uh, back here in Los Angeles for her summer 
uh, in, at the U.S. Attorney's Office and at my firm, Munger, Tolles, and Olson. Um, and then, as with many promising young lawyers, clerkships influenced where she went right after law school. And I do hope the Commission understands this back and forth as I do, because I, I do understand it. It's not unlike what I've gone through myself. And Leandra's nomination for me is a reminder of how our state attracts and retains and calls back home the uh, very best in so many fields. And we are enriched by the wisdom and the knowledge that they bring. As for myself, I'm on my fourth period as a resident, and as the commission can be my witness, uh, this one is for keeps, which I point out only because I think it is the only respect in which my career or judgment is superior to Leandra's, in that I made it back here first. Um, because Leandra truly is superior in every other way, including especially the fact she would never let you know it. Now, the work of the Office of the Solicitor General is an excellent test of the legal profession's highest values because it offers endless opportunities to come up short, and Leandra never did. Her work shows she is among the profession's most careful, sophisticated, and honest legal thinkers and writers. She does her own work. She listens. She thinks. She listens. She thinks. And she listens some more. She keeps confidences, and she has held the public trust for many years with absolute integrity. And her judgment has earned the respect of just about everyone she's met. Uh, among those people uh, is our former colleague, uh, Lisa Blatt, whose unavoidable absence Your Honor noted and who is surely the most vocal of Leandra's admirers. And thinking of Lisa brings to mind her and Leandra's work together in the U.S. Supreme Court in uh, Ricci against Stefano, which was a case that concerned the circumstances under which a local government commits intentional race discrimination when it engages in race-conscious hiring practices to avoid claims of disparate impact discrimination. It was an unusual and extraordinary case in many ways. It was an extreme intellectual challenge. It had especially powerful real-world resonance then and now for the makeup of local police and fire departments and the like. It risked becoming very political. And it was staffed in a very unusual way, not with one assistant, but with two. Lisa, who uh, I remember then was the most uh, senior assistant in the office, and Leandra, who was less so. And it all could have been very unpleasant. But as Lisa would certainly tell you if she were here, those intense months were working with Leandra were an experience that she treasures. Lisa's told me uh, in the past about how Leandra walked her through the case, how Leandra was responsible for the brief's elegant structure and prose, and how Leandra's judgment and temperament and ability to keep the politics out of the picture carried them through, and that it all put her in awe of Leandra's talents as a lawyer, a writer, and as a colleague. And every bit of that rings true for me, too. That case, of course, is just a small snapshot of the enormous substantive field Leandra has worked in. The area in which I personally benefited the most from her expertise is completely different. Uh, it was state criminal law, which, is so, which was so centrally important to our federal practice then for federal criminal sentencing and immigration law and substantive federal criminal law. And Leandra's other, other experience runs the gamut of disability law, employment law, the law of democracy, employee benefits law, administrative law, tax law, telecom law, the law of foreign judgments, and of course constitutional law ranging from the First Amendment to deep questions about separations of, separation of powers. And all this certainly qualifies Leandra to join our state's highest court. Uh, but if I might close with the suggestion that seeing the real wisdom of the governor's nomination lies in understanding the unusual roles that the Office of the Solicitor General and the Office of Legal Counsel play and the role at which Leandra excelled, which is that both offices expose attorneys to the very best and the very worst that our government and our system of laws can have to offer. There is this paradox at the heart of the traditions of both those offices. Their jobs, of course, are to exert and defend the government's prerogatives and interests, but to do so while maintaining the public trust by remaining skeptical of and actively questioning of the government's own officials. And they do that through a dispassionate and honest and full examination of the real consequences of their decisions. And Leandra, for me, epitomizes those traditions. That is what sets her apart. It's what would make her such a fine justice. She is dispassionate without being insensitive to the real concerns of those whose work, uh, those who, who her work affects directly indirectly. I have never once known her to express her views until she has searched and understands all sides of an issue. She would come to the bench with a thoroughly developed understanding of the government's awesome power to do positive good 
through its agencies and prosecutors coupled with appropriate judicious skepticism of the same institutions. And she would bring the wisdom, fortitude, integrity, and resolve to interpret the law in a fair and just way. So on the bench, as in the rest of her career, Leandra would serve the public very well. That is what Justice Stevens saw in hiring her, what Solicitor General Paul Clement saw, what acting Solicitor General Neil Katyal saw. I will reluctantly accept it as why those folks in the Office of Legal Counsel poached her away from her friends in the Office of the Solicitor General. And it is what Governor Brown has recognized in asking this commission to confirm Leandra Kruger as the next Associate Justice of our Supreme Court. So I urge the commission without reservation to confirm the nomination. Thank you, Mr. Horwich. Mr. Liu. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice and members of the commission. Uh, just a quick note at the outset, uh, my testimony today, uh, even though I work at Google, is not based on Googling Leandra's name. Uh, it is based on my own personal views and experiences interacting with her. And so, of course, they reflect my own views and not necessarily those of Google. Before I joined Google, I had the privilege of working uh, in various positions in the federal government. First, as an attorney advisor at the DOJ Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, next, as a law clerk on the Supreme Court. And finally, as the Acting General Counsel at the White House Office of Management and Budget. And it was in these roles that I got to know Leandra. Um, and I can tell you, she is every bit as good as her stellar reputation. I have no doubt she will make an outstanding justice on the California Supreme Court. You've heard from Ben about Leandra's exceptional uh, appellate advocacy skills. And she made quite the impression uh, among the group of clerks when I was at the court. Um, and that's particularly high praise given the rarefied company of Supreme Court advocates. But what I want to focus my testimony on today is her time at the DOJ Office of Legal Counsel. As this commission is likely aware, OLC serves a uniquely important role in the executive branch. It provides authoritative legal advice. So what does that mean in practice? If two or more agencies have a legal dispute, those agencies, and sometimes the president himself, goes to OLC and asks OLC to resolve that dispute. Once OLC resolves that dispute, that legal decision is then binding across all federal agencies. So in that sense, OLC is often described as a kind of a mini Supreme Court within the executive branch. So why is Leandra's experience there relevant here? Well, again, we all know Leandra can write a great brief. She can argue a case before a court. But what OLC, her experiences at OLC tell us is that she has a very deep understanding of the difference between the advocacy and the judicial roles. At OLC, Leandra's job is to decide what the best view of the law is. In that role, she's not a zealous advocate. She is an honest broker. To put it another way, at OLC, the question isn't whether a question is defensible. It's not whether a legal position is defensible. It's whether a legal position is right. And so Leandra's experiences at OLC really tell us that she can exercise the kind of independent, principled legal judgment you'd want in a Supreme Court justice for California. Now, in exercising that judgment, uh, Leandro's had to tackle an extraordinarily varied and diverse set of legal issues. I mean, Ben uh, described the, really the gamut of issues she's had to deal with. And one of the roles that she has to play at OLC is to review pending legislation for constitutionality, as well as the legality of regulations issued by agencies across these broad statutory schemes. Um, and what Leandro really has done is become an expert at constitutional law and administrative law and many other areas of law has been described. And those, uh, those kinds of issues really range the gamut from some of the most obscure and arcane questions of statutory interpretation to some of the most weighty and pressing issues of constitutional law. Now, in researching and deciding on a legal question at OLC, um, Leandra recognizes you can't do that in a vacuum. And so what are her other responsibilities in the office is to represent DOJ at interagency meetings uh, across DOJ and to really get the views of all the interested stakeholders um, at play. You know, Leandra isn't somebody who comes to a legal question with her own pre existing views or conceptions of the facts of the law. At OLC, for example, she understands it's the agencies who are the subject matter experts of the statutes they administer. 
And so she more broadly understands, to really understand the implications of a legal de decision, you have to study, listen, and listen carefully to those most closely involved so that you understand, for example, how the law actually works, how the relevant programs actually work, and ultimately, how your legal decision is going to have a real-world impact on the ground. Finally, the attorneys that I've admired the most at OLC over the years are the ones that don't shy away from making a decision if the decision needs to be made. OLC attorneys are asked to decide some of the most sensitive and difficult questions in the government today. The best attorneys at OLC, they have a, a backbone, a strength of character that reflects an overarching commitment to the rule of law. And sometimes that means deciding questions in a way that is contrary to the policy views of some of the most powerful people in the executive branch or the Congress. Based on everything I've observed, Leandra exemplifies the very best qualities of OLC attorneys in this tradition. In sum, it's hard to imagine someone more well-suited to the bench than Leandra. She has the smarts. Not only does she have the smarts, I should say, she has the considered judgment, the temperament, and the strength of character that will make her an outstanding justice. She has my highest endorsement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. The commission will now hear from Mr. Lee. Madam Chief Justice, Attorney General Harris, Presiding Justice Klein, uh, at the request of this commission, the Jenny Commission uh, wrote a letter summarizing its report to the governor on the candidate, Leandra R. Kruger. It's from this letter that I read. The commission conducted its evaluation of Ms. Kruger on December 16, 2014, finding her exceptionally well qualified. According to our rules, this rating, our highest, means that she possesses qualities and attributes of remarkable or extraordinary superiority that enable her to perform the appellate judicial function with distinction. Our report to the governor's office described that Ms. Kruger engaged in appellate practice at the highest level. She has argued 12 cases before the US Supreme Court. She has spent the last two years providing advice to the president and the executive branch agencies on constitutional and other complex legal issues when agencies disagree. She will bring a unique and valuable perspective to the Supreme Court should she be confirmed. The summary of our report, which forms the basis of our exceptionally well-qualified rating, recognized Ms. Kruger's stellar credentials, having graduated from Harvard College, magna cum laude, and Yale Law School, serving as editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal clerk for Justice John Paul Stevens of the U.S. Supreme Court, and has risen through the ranks at the U.S. Department of Justice. She has excelled at all her endeavors and is praised for her intellectual firepower, written and oral advocacy skills, impeccable judgment, her fairness, diplomacy, and her composure under pressure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I invite Ms. Kruger to come forward to present a statement and to answer any questions the Commission may have. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, Attorney General Harris, and Justice Klein. I am deeply honored and deeply humbled to be appearing before you today. I'm particularly humbled to be here present for Justice Klein's last legal act, your decades of distinguished judicial service and service to the community have been an inspiration to countless men and women across the state and across the nation. You will be very missed on the appellate bench. Thank you. I'm also deeply humbled to have been nominated by Governor Brown to the, the seat that was held by Justice Joyce Kennard, whose quarter century of service has been marked by a dedication to the principles of independence, to integrity, and to the fundamental principle of judging each case as it comes one case at a time. Hers are very big shoes to fill. 
Finally, I'm humbled by the support that my family, friends, and colleagues have shown me throughout this process and indeed throughout my life. I'm particularly grateful to the friends and family who are able to come here today during this holiday week from points across Los Angeles and San Bernardino counties and beyond. And with the commission's indulgence, I'd like to introduce just a few of them who are here with me today. In the front row, there's my husband, Brian, who's a lawyer who until recently also worked at the United States Department of Justice. There's the man who married us, my uncle, Pedrito, who is a minister and a professor of theology in Walla Walla, Washington. My cousin, Elizabeth, who came from Jamaica to live with us growing up and is now a teacher in Los Angeles where she lives with her family. There are also cousins, Sam and Arlene, one of my siblings, Charles, the first lawyer I ever knew, um, who's, who I've known throughout my life, Deborah DeBose, who's now a school principal in Pasadena. I'm so pleased that they were able to make it. There are many people who unfortunately could not be here today. Um, my sister, Ruthann, and her family, my two-year-old son, who has many fine qualities, but the ability to sit quietly is not one of them. <laughs> And we also today remember my father, who passed away nine years ago this week. My dad, who was the son of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, throughout his lifetime answered the call to serve his country, first as a young man serving the country during wartime, and later providing health care to the underserved in Mississippi in 1960s. Through his life, he modeled the value of selfless service to others. Finally, I'd like to introduce my mom, Audrey Reed. My mom grew up in a small town in Jamaica called Rock River, and as a child, she read a book about Albert Schweitzer and decided that she wanted to follow in his footsteps and become a doctor. She came to this country to pursue her schooling to make that dream a reality. That dream took her to college in Michigan, it took her to Howard Medical School in Washington, DC, and finally it took her to Los Angeles and to Pasadena, where she met and married my dad, set up her own practice, and where I was born and raised. From her, I learned the value of education and hard work. I learned through her example of reaching out to people from all walks of life that what unites us is far more important than anything that might divide us. And because of her, I was raised with the belief that anything is possible if you set your mind to it, but that with great opportunities come great responsibilities to contribute and to be of service to others. I've spent most of my career in public service with the federal government in our nation's capital first as a law clerk to two federal appellate judges, and later in various capacities in the United States Department of Justice, where I worked as an advocate arguing the positions of the federal government before the United States Supreme Court, and in the Office of Legal Counsel, where I provide authoritative and objective legal advice to the president and the executive branch, including on how to resolve legal disputes between agencies when they disagree. Through these experiences, I've learned a great deal about the critical importance of the courts and the work that judges do every day in safeguarding the fair and impartial administration of justice. I have learned about the important role a Supreme Court plays in resolving complex legal questions and maintaining the integrity and uniformity of legal doctrine. I've learned that each case has to be approached on its own merits based on its own unique facts. I've learned that the issues that come before Supreme Court are not merely legal abstractions. They're issues that have real and sometimes profound practical consequences. I've learned the importance of approaching each of these difficult questions with humility, with fidelity to precedent, with respect for the roles of the other branches of government, with an openness to listening to diverse and sometimes divergent views, and with a sensitivity to the practical effects of a high court's decision on the work that goes on every day in trial courts and on people's everyday lives. Growing up in Southern California, I could never have imagined that I would one day be standing here before you as a nominee to our state's highest court. I'm grateful for the gracious homecoming I've received from my colleagues in the bar and on the bench, and I look forward to working with you if I'm fortunate enough to serve. I'm also grateful to the many talented and dedicated lawyers and public servants I've had the great fortune to work with over the course of my career and from whom I have learned so much. And finally, I owe a great debt of gratitude to the many who have come before me, to the men and women who've worked tirelessly for decades to make the legal profession open to all. Their journeys have made mine possible. And so it's with a deep sense of gratitude that I pledge that if confirmed, I will uphold the great responsibilities and duties of this office 
and serve the people of California to the very best of my abilities. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions the commission may have. Thank you, Ms. Kruger. Any questions? Well, in reading the many, many, many pages of documents um, regarding your career, I'll quote the words that, that are um, on each one of these pages many times. Uh, analytical skills superlative, brilliant, incredibly smart, unflappable, incredibly smart, wickedly smart. Intelligence, quote, and I believe this might have been a sitting member of the United States Supreme Court, off the charts. Uncompromising integrity. Another um, very high positioned person in our field. Analytical skills over the moon. Um, one even wrote, and in addition to all of that, an opposite of a blowhard. So I don't really have any questions about your skills. <laughs> Um, but as a fellow native Californian who also lived in D.C., what most excites you about coming home? You know, I've had the great fortune to, to serve the federal government for many years in Washington, D.C., um, but my heart has always been in California. This has always been my home. It's where I was born and raised. It's where I learned the values that make me the person that I am today. It's where my family still lives. Um, it's a state that is incredibly rich in the, the cultural diversity of its people, in the diversity of the, uh, its economic activities, everything under the sun that you can imagine in the United States you can find here in California. Um, and so for me, it is both a professional and a personal delight to have this opportunity to come back home, and it would be a tremendous privilege to get to serve the people of California on this very fine court. Thank you. I, too, am a native daughter, sixth-generation Californian. And as I leave with a heavy heart, I am void with the prospect of your becoming a justice on this extremely competent court. And uh, makes me feel a little better mm. about doing something else knowing that you're going to be there directing the activities of the court and the development of the law. So thank you very much for your willingness to serve. Thank you very much, Justice Klein. I greatly appreciate that. So Ms. Kruger, I also have had the pleasure of reading the personal data questionnaire, as well as the report by the Attorney General and the commentary and remarks of colleagues, adversaries, that of yours throughout the process of your legal career. Truly stellar. I agree with all the comments made thus far. Um, but what I am concerned about is that the public, California, doesn't get to hear and see some of your superb answers to some of the questions in the questionnaire. And so I'd like to give you this opportunity to comment on some observations that have been made in California regarding the lack of judicial experience or the lack of California legal experience. I found your answers in the questionnaire to be telling and reassuring, and I'm excited by all of those answers. But I'd like to give you this opportunity to speak to those. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice. And another native Californian. <laughs> <laughs> um, over the course of my career, I've had the great good fortune to have a series of jobs that's given me exposure to a wide variety of subject matters. Um, I have the kind of job where you know, I will handle a federal civil rights question in the morning and turn to a question at the intersection of federal and state criminal law in the afternoon. And the next day, I come in to work on an issue concerning federal preemption of a state statute um, or a state regulation. For example, a California vessel fuel regulation was an issue that I worked on um, some time ago in the Solicitor General's office. I've always liked to say that the, the path that I chose in the law is the perfect path for someone with a short attention span um, because you are constantly learning and it's one of the things that's been so exciting and so fulfilling to me about the career that I've led so far. One of the things that particularly attracted me to the Department of Justice was the opportunity to look at questions um, from a more holistic 
balanced perspective than you often get to when you're representing an individual client. In the Office of the Solicitor General, we recognize that our job is to represent the United States, our client, but it's also to serve the court and to think hard about how we can help the court in performing its very important work of upholding the rule of law and ensuring the integrity of, of legal doctrine. Um, in the Office of Legal Counsel, where I've worked, the job is, again, to provide objective legal advice to resolve disputes about, between different agencies that may take different views of what the law commands. And through those experiences, through the experience of talking to trial attorneys throughout the government, talking to administrators, um, talking to the people who have to work with the law every day and who will have to conform their conduct to the court's decisions, I've gained a deep appreciation both for the importance of objectivity, of fair-mindedness, of openness in judging, and for the very practical effects um, that the court's decision have on the conduct of the work that goes on every day in trial courts and on the ground throughout the nation. Um, that said, I also know that coming to this court, I would be coming to serve with a group of individuals who collectively have an enormous wealth of experience trying and adjudicating cases under California law at every level, and would hope to be able to draw on their expertise as I do my own work, and at the same time would hope that the experiences that I have in my unique background would bring a perspective that would add to that chorus of voices and would help us all to deliberate and decide cases in a manner that best serves the people of California. Thank you, Ms. Kruger, and one other question. I noted with interest, given your extremely wide um, band of talent and expertise, that you chose to teach civics at one point. And I think civics is an initiative for the branch. It's very important for understanding our democracy. It's important as we go forward. I believe there's a great need for it in California and elsewhere. But I'd like to hear from your eloquent voice why it is you chose to teach civics, of all things, in high schools. <laughs> Um, that's right. I helped to, to teach civics in Boston area public schools, um, in part because there is, I think, no greater investment that we can make in our future than in teaching children from a young age about the importance of engagement in our democracy. And the exciting thing about going into schools and sort of making the, um, the conduct of government and the principles of democracy real for students was seeing the, the excitement on their faces when they realized that they too would have a voice in, in the world around them and a say over um, sort of what laws are passed and how uh, government does its very important work. Um, and so for all those reasons, I think civics education is, is vital um, as an investment in our future. We have a side job for you here. <laughs> <laughs> this completes the, lit the list of witnesses who are here to testify. I'd ask you to have a seat, Ms. Kruger. Is the commission ready to vote? Yes. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I guess I don't need to even finish the rest of the sentence. Yes. <laughs> Aye. It is unanimous. The Commission on Judicial Appointments, having considered the correspondence, received the testimony given at this meeting, finds Ms. Leandra R. Kruger qualified to be Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of California and hereby confirms her appointment. Uh, Ms. Kruger will be administered the oath of office at a later time, but after you come to and speak to the audience here, Please, we ask you to step to the robing room so we can sign the official documents for the Secretary of State and please bring your family. But we now invite you to the podium. As an advocate, one of, the, one of the first rules you learn is to say what you have to say and then sit down as quickly as possible before you try everyone's patience. So I'm going to try to follow that rule today. Um, I do have just one more thing to say to all of you, which is thank you. I thank Governor Brown for the trust and confidence that he has shown in me. Thank you to the commission for your careful consideration and your uh, Herculean efforts to make it here today. 
I thank the Jenny Commission um, for your careful investigation and evaluation over what I know is a, a very tight time frame. I thank my family and friends, and particularly my husband, Brian, who's been my rock throughout this process and through many other things besides. And finally, I'd like to thank the court staff who have extended me such a wonderful welcome and who have made this day possible, particularly Frank McGuire and Jorge Navarrete. Um, they have, at every turn, really gone the extra mile to help ensure the my smooth possible transition to the court. I'm grateful to you all and look forward to getting to work together on behalf of the people of California. I hope to have the chance to thank each of you personally after this hearing. Thank you. The commission will adjourn to sign documents in the robing room and on behalf of the California Supreme Court and all of us here, welcome and we look forward to working with you. We stand adjourned.